Hey, everybody. Hope everything's going well with everybody. Y'all remember my online friend, uh, Nikki, that um, we had first met back in late 2018. You can see here we had many conversations. Um, we Here is when we first talked on the phone for a little over an hour or whatnot. And through the years, how we, you know, exchanged information back and forth. Maybe either one of us may have not always been exactly perfectly correct on our information, but we still stayed in communication and just tried to, you know, get information back and forth, uh, starting out with the Kanika case and just going on from there. And then she did the, the MTV show and then the Oxygen Network show. Well, tonight when I went to go get that battery for my pickup truck, I was looking for something to put on to make noise while I was driving. And um, Mama Duck was on live and she made mention about an episode on the Wii channel of Hip Hop Homicides. Now, I had not heard of this yet. So I was watching the episode. It's on YouTube. And about three quarters of the way through it, I hear Nikki's voice. And so I'm trying to get to the part where I contacted her tonight. Um, it's a very good show. I, I want to share it with y'all. Uh, of course, I can't play it for y'all because of the copyrights and all that. But she's doing this in... Uh, Together with uh, 50 Cent, Curtis Jackson. Yeah, here we go, here we go. Let's see. So this was 4.52 this evening. I said, girl, do your thing, congratulations. And I sent her uh, a link to the episode that I was watching. She said, thanks, yeah, that's my show. I said, for real. I said, Every, since the Kanika case, I've dove head over heels into the culture I have 300 gigabytes plus of content that I have not even put out with FOIA request videos the whole nine yards she says oh yeah it's a lot and I I have to really compartmentalize basically because it's, it breaks down into so many different little things okay she says but yeah 50 heard Don and I's podcast about Biggie and then contacted us to develop hip hop homicides. So we built that show from the ground up to the full series. I said, no shit. I says, I started a spreadsheet connecting the guns to the crimes and so forth. I says, damn, I'm proud of you. She says, you know, there's a gun ring from Chicago to Atlanta. That's why all of the OTF was out there. I says, yeah, what got me though was the FBI knew in January that they were what they were planning on doing to Duck. I says, I had read some of the documents over on the FBI website. Nikki says, they transport them back and forth. Even military guys are involved. Look up the G Herbo connection. I said, yeah, I had read some on that as well. And I says, let me finish watching your episode on Vaughn to see if y'all came out with the same reason that I heard was the reason for his fight that night. Now, before I get into the new series that has just been published, let me show y'all a few seconds, a minute or so, whatever, of Nikki with the Oxygen Network channel, so that way y'all can hear her voice, and y'all will be able to recognize it just as I was able to recognize it when I heard it. First, I'll go through your regular Facebook profile. If I don't find you there, I will search you on LinkedIn. LinkedIn will usually get job. Your job leads me to your work directory, and I can trace you there. Kanika yeah. Jenkins. The story of Kanika Jenkins starts with her and her friends partying at the Crown Plaza Hotel outside of Chicago. Around 3 a.m., hotel cameras recorded Kanika intoxicated, stumbling through the halls. Everybody wanted to know how this girl was walking around in that condition. Throughout the night, several of Kanika's friends live streamed little snippets of the party. The problem with the Kanika case, 
point simply came down to a statement from a local activist that was taken out of context. So an activist came along to help the family and inadvertently mentioned that there was footage of her going into the freezer. However, there was no security footage above the freezer. And I think from there is when the conspiracy theories just started through the internet into a full-on chaos frenzy. Surrounding Kanika Jenkins, the mafia did it. It was organ trafficking. The hotel was part of a child trafficking network. Her friend set her up for two hundred dollars. This was a gang initiation. It's rival gangs. This was all a setup. It was an Illuminati sacrifice. Her mom did this in order to get the insurance claim that all of it was fake. That it was based on another story that was written three years ago about a girl named Brianna Jenkins. That the Rosemont PD were actively involved in the death of Kanika Jenkins. That the tapes were edited. That the hotel definitely had something to do with it and it was the creepy security guard and also the manager of the hotel i mean you name it this girl went through it that night so let me share with y'all a little bit about um some of the little clips and hopefully they won't get me on copyrights uh that she had in a couple of these episodes all right now i will say this real quick i slowed his voice down and i speeded hers up a little bit again hoping to not get snatched and caught with the copyright because in reality i'm actually promoting this stuff but she doesn't get to say so on that so hopefully hopefully the insurgents won't catch it now the first episode is about pop smoke let me let you listen a bit hello nikki what's going on i'm finding myself trying to get to the bottom of exactly what was the internet uproar surrounding Mike D. People knew that Hot Smoke and Mike D were the best of friends, where one was, the other was right next to him. People found it kind of off that Mike had made some social media posts flashing back the cash, and at one point, he actually sent out a photo on Instagram that had the address they were staying at. Wow. Nikki, what's going on? We were able to track down Amelia Rose, the girl from the video with Pop Smoke. Wow. It's been a little bit of a struggle. She's a little afraid. Um, obviously, this girl's been through a lot. You know, she said she hasn't talked about this for two years because she's afraid they're going to come after her. Right. But there's a couple of things that I wanted to tell you before we go into this. She's been posting a lot of stuff about Mike D and his involvement. She's basically saying, Mike, you know what you did. So she seems to be pointing a finger directly at Mike. Yeah. That is... Absolutely shocking. That's something we definitely have to talk to him about. We definitely need to do our best to, to, to try to get in touch with her. We need to figure out what she knows and uh, we need to figure out if what she's saying has any merit beyond rumor and innuendo. I'll do my best and I'll keep along the way. Thank you so much, Nikki. Now, this next episode is going to be number two in the series, which is going to cover King Von. Now, they do talk to his sister, his ex-girlfriend, his manager, and they bring up a lot of good detail about why was his friend Sully that got shot how come nobody's really spoken on that? Their theory is that the police officers in Atlanta shot him and killed him. Okay, we are right here. Nikki, I can see the Hookah Lounge Monaco right here. I can see Chic Restaurant Lounge. Um, I guess the question is, run us through how this whole thing happened. So the altercation began next to the Sheik Lounge. Right. So King Vaughn walked over to Fondo Rondo. Vaughn and Quando get into a physical altercation. It was spills into the street. And at that point, Quando's boy, Lil Tim, he runs up and he pulls out a gun and fires one fatal shot to King Vaughn. At that point, the crew starts shooting at each other. His friend, Mark Blakely, who goes by the nickname Slutty, is out of the car to shoot at Tim, but his gun shoots. But Tim gets hit. Tim hits the ground. Right. And Blakely is still holding the jam gun in his hand and takes off running across the street. And Mark Blakely was shot and killed in that parking lot. Right where you're standing, Vaughn's boys start to pick him up off the ground. They drag him over to a vehicle. 
Obviously, it looks pretty bad. They got to get him to the hospital. Correct. They decide to self-transport him. So why did he start the fight in the first place? Well, yeah, well, frankly, that is the big mystery what the altercation was. All right, now on this next episode, which is, I believe, number eight, they're going to cover FBG Duck. Now, they're going to speak on some of the dis, uh, respect that they were doing in their songs and lyrics and things, and I'll talk some more on that after this little clip. Hi, Dan. Nikki, can you tell us anything about the, the guys listening in diamond as the killers? of FBG Duck. So there's actually five that were indicted for the murder of FBG Duck. We have Charles Williams. Charles goes by C. Murder. C. Murder lost a brother in 2012, right around the time that the thieves started going back and forth with Oblock and 63rd. He's walking out of the store, he's shot with a single gunshot wounds the head, and right outside of Oblock. But then we have Thomas Roberson. Everyone knows him as Kenny Mack. We also have Carlos Offord. He goes by Lowe's. He actually is a rapper. He goes by the name Lost Mana. And then there's Christopher Thomas. He goes by Z Thing. And Marcus Martin, who we all know as Mubla. Five members of the Oblock Street Gang, a faction of the Black Disciples, arrested and federally charged with committing murder in aid of racketeering. These guys were actually indicted on multiple charges. They charged them with a repo act. What does that mean for this case? That means it's a federal case. It means they've worked on it for quite some time. There's informants involved. There is audio involved. There is music videos that are being brought up in court that have been used to touch the killers. I mean, they elaborated that they were increasing the status of the enterprise through the use of social media platforms and music. You know, all of these guys did appear in music videos and on. Wow, they're making a connection between what we're hearing in the music and furtherance of a criminal conspiracy. Correct. Okay, where you saw me put that insert, I said this part right here about Charles Liggins. She said her his brother got shot back in 2012 from across the street. Um, here is a insert from a, a, a diss song about the ops. But I just took the one part about his brother, which is Gerard Biggins. And I slowed it way down and I put the caption so you can understand what they're saying. Because, no, they don't enunciate their words very clear. Some folks call them mumble rappers. Some of them are, some of them are. These happen to be so. They walk at his ass They hit his ass in his neck. Like they the dead. The dead. All right, now before we can find out about Troy Liggins, who's from Old Block, that was Wick City at the time, we're gonna have to go back in time. So what y'all are fixing to find out about is the definition of the butterfly effect. Some people call it a domino effect. But let me take you on a little journey, catch a little education on how things really go in Chicago. All right. Before I take y'all on this journey, let me just say this. This information comes mostly from police reports done by FOIA request. Other information comes from social media. Everything's alleged, even if it is in the police reports. I'll just say it like that. And for any of the negativity thought process of why is this out of town or woman, whatever, speaking on these things. Well, let me just put it like this. Didn't I just prove who people still come to to get information? Regardless of their location, their gender, or their skin color. My condolences go out to all the loved ones of the ones that were left behind. I do this to raise awareness to others as consequences of society and only positive words should be spoken 
on the ones that have passed on. Because if we don't speak up for them, who will? It's not a matter of picking sides. It's a matter of speaking facts and being loyal to those facts. Now, most of the time when we hear the story of the history between O Block and STL EBT, we hear that the beef started with Tuka. So I'm going to give you a, just a really brief clip on Tuka. But just know the beef was there way before then. All right, this article is from January the 13th. 2011. 15-year-old Chanel Gregory was shot in the 500 block of East 63rd Street. The boy was on the street when a suspect got out of a vehicle and shot him multiple times. That gunman got back into the car and fled west on 63rd. Police say Gregory was dead on the scene. The incident is possibly gang-related. No one is in custody. Lisa Fielding, News Radio 780, WBBM says the police said the boy and two other people were waiting for the westbound 63rd street bus when the gunman walked up and asked everyone if there was another bus coming he then walked behind the bus shelter pulled a silver handgun and shot gregory once the boy staggered to a nearby trash can where the gunman shot him three more times in the back he was dead on the scene when the ambulance arrived nobody else was in autopsy of Gregory who lived at the 5200 block of South Calumet Avenue is scheduled for that Thursday the medical examiner said well I don't think they needed an autopsy okay. now on the old block we must discuss Wick City first which includes Holy Perry Reese, aka Rava Roy, T. Roy, and King Von. Understand how the transition came about and how the old beefs were inherited. Now, before we can even speak on Reese or Sheroid, we got to go back a little bit further. Before it was Oblock, it was Wick City. The three eyes is for the tray. Wild, insane, crazy. O Block is a black disciple set originally called Parkway Gardens, located on the 6400 block of South King Drive, also known as one of the most dangerous blocks in the country. O Block was named after the member Odie Perry, who was murdered back in 2011. O Block is also known as Wick City, Toontown, Eda World, Troy Squad, Whitey Gang, Mona Gang, Stretch Gang. City of Heck and Get Back Game. Named after fallen members from Big City, O Block. O Block is clicked up with the 600, where they go by the name OB 600. They also align with Lamron, which is 300, and 400 East Drive. Back in the early 1900s, the area of Parkway Gardens was actually a huge amusement park named White City which opened in 1905, which was very successful, but closed in 1933 after a fire would burn down almost the entire park, causing thousands of dollars in damage. In the early 1950s, a 35-building complex named as Parkway Gardens was built around the same area White City was and is now famously known as Oblock. Now, in some other videos, I will go more into detail about Oblock and the members and how their lives have turned out. But for now, we're gonna jump over to STL EBT. Now, and actually going back into the history, we would be going back to the sets that we know as STL EBT. Now, way back in history, before the, even the 2000s, STL was known as Boss City, and EBT was known as Murderville. STL wasn't really that popular in Chicago back then and was actually not that of a dangerous gang, unlike the EBT, which was known for their dangerous shooters, 
who would rob other gang members that they were beefing with and also kill them. EBT is, stands for Everybody Trapping. STL is for St. Lawrence Avenue. For me, the most interesting thing is how EBT started out so large and strong, and now they had a role reversal to where it's all STL, Jaro City, and Taekwondo World. Very few EBT members are even left. Now I'm going to go ahead and end this one here, and I will come back and go into more greater detail about different details on each one of these sets. Hope you enjoy it. Please like, share, subscribe, leave a comment below. Let me know what your thoughts are. Any questions, I'll see if I can get the answers if I don't already have them. Again, condolences to all the loved ones who've been left behind.